So, Adam, there's uh, a couple of things I want to talk to you about uh, in terms of uh, where the Democrats uh, go from here. But the best place, it seems to me, to start would be with the race for the DNC chair. Um, three or four candidates, I think, have put their names into the mix. The most prominent, uh, well-known, and the one who's received the most endorsements uh, is Keith Ellison, congressman from Minnesota. And this week, he may have very well uh, changed the tenor of the race. Uh, this uh, guy obviously uh, was uh, one of the early ones to put his hat in the ring and, and, and received a lot of endorsements. He is uh, co-chair of the Progressive uh, Caucus in the House. The big knock supposedly against Keith Ellison was that people didn't want a, uh, someone who was doing the DNC chair as a part-time thing which he, of course, is a congressman. Well, he announced this week that he would be willing to step down uh, if he won the uh, the chair of the DNC. Uh, does that leave anything left uh, in terms of arguments against his uh, being the chair? Uh, not in terms of great arguments. Uh, first, good to be here. Uh, second, uh, you know, the, the big there's a big picture goal here first, which is you know, basically progressives need to, you know, win the heart and soul of the Democratic Party. And that includes things like following Elizabeth Warren into battle. Uh, it also includes uh, this very important race for DNC chair. And, you know, with Keith Ellison, um, you know, he achieves really two things. First, you know, he is, his election would be an acknowledgement by Democrats that we need a more vibrant, more ideological uh, Democratic Party that stands up with backbone and is a true progressive uh, you know, organization, you know, being co-chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and a longtime progressive fighter, you know, he would stand for that proposition. And the second is just on a logistical organizational level, you know, we need a true partner in there, someone who will work hand in hand with the progressive community, including the progressive grassroots, and allow us to plug into the DNC, plug the DNC's resources into us, really be kind of a mutual force multiplier, allowing all of our efforts to be stronger. And Keith, having been in the trenches with us for years, uh, understanding how progressive movement organizations work, um, you know, being a great inside-outside partner in Congress um, would be perfect for that. So, you know, that's kind of why we've endorsed him. And, you know, unfortunately, there are, there are some smears being put out there against him, um, and, you know, very much, very similar to the ones that were put out early against Barack Obama. Um, but I think he took off the most mainstream argument, we'll put it that way, uh, by saying that he'd be willing to resign his chair, uh, his uh, congressional seat, if he wins, and we'll see where that lands him. Well, let's talk about these smears, because I think these, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there seems to me to be, you know, multiple issues involved in this. Uh, um, the... Um, uh, Haim uh, Sabin, I believe is his name. He's a billionaire who um, uh, has uh, supported uh, various people in the Democratic Party, it was a Hillary Clinton supporter. Um, he came out, and I guess he gave some type of press conference at, or, or a sp talk at the Brookings Institution, which is what you get to do if you're a billionaire, because you, you give money to these organizations and, um, and they let you speak. And, and to be fair, maybe... Uh, you know, uh, repackaging uh, the Power Rangers gives you uh, qualifications to head to a think tank without a billion dollars, but I, but I, but I doubt it. But he was the one who claimed that uh, Keith Ellison is um, anti-Semitic, uh, anti-Israel. We saw Steve Emerson, the guy who claimed that um, there were no-go cities in Britain, and was called, I think, an idiot by uh, David Cameron. Um, he was the guy who, who did some clipping of uh, some video to make it seem like uh, Keith Ellison had a problem with Jews. I mean, I mean, let's talk about the the idea that this that we have a billionaire who is a uh, purported uh, supporter of the Democratic Party uh, going around and launching these types of smears against someone who is a co-chair of the Progressive Caucus and a sitting member of Congress. I mean, this is pretty stunning we got this also from the adl when we literally have a vowed white nationalist in the white house yeah it's it's pretty it's pretty ridiculous and you know in general i think there are members of the uh political establishment members of the you know 
smaller corporate wing of the Democratic Party, uh, you know, and people of that type that fear Keith Ellison or any strong progressive like Keith Ellison uh, becoming the chair of the party. It represents a sea change away from the establishment. I think in this particular case, there are also people with um, a very discreet issue set that they are kind of reading into this race, you know, assuming any semblance of good faith, um, where it doesn't really belong. You know, it doesn't, uh, Keith Ellison has gone above and beyond to, you know, build partnerships with the Jewish community. And there's like really his, his, um, you know, respect for the Jewish community or Israel is not really in doubt. Um, if they're looking for, you know, uh, you know, someone whose top priority is Israel to lead the Democratic Party, again, it just seems a little bit um, to be playing in the wrong ballpark. You know, what's, what's really needed here and what we need to keep the focus on is that we need to see change in the Democratic Party. We need, you know, part of the reason the Democrats lost in 2016 is that, you know, Trump, even though he had almost zero policy proposals, a story that he told consistently that was clear and powerful about the need for systemic change. You know, he really played to people's economic anxieties to take on the political elite and the corporate elite, and he threw in some xenophobia, you know, on the side uh, or or in the center. But you know, we need to offer a compelling counter narrative about how you know, the economy is rigged, our democracy is broken with our broken campaign finance laws, and how we're going to clean it up. And uh, we also need somebody who is dedicated to weaning the Democratic Party off of corporate money, like this billionaire, off of like Wall Street, and onto a more small dollar um, base, like Bernie Sanders had. Doesn't have to be exclusively small dollar, but we need to wean ourselves off the most odious of the big dollars and dramatically increase the reliance on small do- donors. And that's how the party gains credibility again. And that, that again is a fear that there's a active fear for the billionaire class um, and the corporate establishment. And and I think, you know, frankly, we can see, you know, the it seems to me that from uh, that the way that we see a translation of of certain ideologies within the Democratic Party to actual just core competence. I mean, from my perspective, there were multiple reasons why Hillary Clinton lost, uh, some of which were out of her control, but some of which were in her control as you know, in terms of the campaign. I mean, aside from the fact that maybe she was a flawed candidate to begin with, um, you know, we're still talking about 70,000 votes. We would be having a much, much different uh, conversation right now. And to a large extent, if you look at the failure uh, that the campaign um, engaged in from a tactical and strategic standpoint, strategically, they were attempting to garner the votes of of suburban Republican voters. Uh, They specifically laid off Paul Ryan to do so. They were specifically uh, uh, Schumer and, and Clinton. At the very least, Schumer was bragging about uh, a tax repatriation deal they were going to put together with Ryan. Uh, they were bra- making these brags in October for what they anticipated was going to have in November. That clearly was, a, you could draw a direct line from the ideological uh, goals to uh, the tactical failures and strategic failures in winning the election, right? I mean, they wanted to retain that um, relationship so they could make certain deals that I happen to disagree with ideologically, but that that also prevented them from following a a um, a, a, a strategy and uh, to to win the election. They lost the election. You could argue that their relationship with big data also uh, screwed them over from a tactical standpoint uh, in, in Pennsylvania when you're going around and knocking on uh, 20% of the doors you're knocking on are Trump voters uh, because you have no, your ground game consists of, of basically the same type of big data that we inherit from, from corporations as opposed to sort of organizing on, on the ground. All right, with all that said, we're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about that, and uh, I will let you talk, um, Adam. Uh, I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about the first fights that you anticipate uh, Democrats with uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders and hopefully uh, a guy like Keith Ellison out in front are going to engage in over the next, uh, well, a couple of months. we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more Sam Cedar, Ring of Fire. I'm talking to Adam Green 
from the uh, Progressive Change Campaign Committee. 